Welcome to STEM Talk. 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 Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Cornegas, and joining me to introduce today's podcast is the man behind the curtain, Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests who appear on STEM Talk. Hi, Don. Great to be here. So as NASA's Perseverance rover makes its way across the rocky terrain of Mars, we thought it would be a really good time to have the chairman of the Mars Institute back on the show. Pascal Lee is a planetary scientist at the SETI Institute and director of the NASA Houghton Mars Project at NASA Ames Research Center. In fact, Ken was also at NASA Ames Research Center in the late 90s. Yes, NASA Ames is a great place to be, and I enjoyed my time there. So we interviewed Pascal back in 2016 and talked to him about his annual visits to the high Arctic's Devon Island, the Earth's largest uninhabited land that has geological characteristics that are similar to what scientists believe we will find on Mars. Today, we catch up with Pascal and his Houghton Mars project, as well as get his take on the Perseverance rover, which landed on Mars just a few weeks before our interview with Pascal. We also talked to Pascal about future manned missions to Mars and whether he thinks we will ever find signs of alien life in our galaxy. But before Ken and I get to our interview with Pascal, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we are especially appreciative of all the wonderful five-star reviews. As always, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing iTunes, Google, Stitcher, and other podcast apps for the wittiest and most lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. If you hear you review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the moniker Wacko or Waco (laughs) Driver. I like both of those interpretations, a a Waco Driver and a Wacko Driver. I'm not sure which, but it's a great review. Either way. (laughs) The review is titled Music to Ears. The review reads, STEM Talk reminds me of listening to a great orchestra that breathes new life into music we thought was familiar. With Ken as the conductor and Don as the first violin, they invite the best guests to play the role of soloist and stimulate our thoughts out into new frontiers where we discover new perspectives to ponder, which makes for a very enriching experience, a very addicting experience indeed. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Waco or Wacko Driver. <laughs> That's a really wonderful review. And thank you to all of the other STEM Talk listeners who've helped STEM Talk become such a great success. Okay. And now on to our interview with Pascal Lee. STEM Talk. 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 Hi, welcome to STEM Talk. I'm your host, Don Cornegas, and joining us today is Pascal Lee. Pascal, welcome to the podcast. Uh, Hi, Don. Thank you for having me. And also with us is Ken Ford. Hello, Don, and hello, Pascal. Hi, Ken. And Pascal, I guess I have to say welcome back. So when we last talked to you back in 2016, you were about to spend your 20th consecutive summer on Devon Island, which is Earth's largest uninhabited island with geological characteristics that are similar to what we believe we're seeing on Mars. And in fact, although you lived in California for more than two decades, you've never spent a summer on the beach in California because you've always been on Devon Island. But because of COVID-19, you had your annual summer Devon Island expedition canceled last year from what we understand. So how disappointing was that? That had to be pretty pretty much of a bummer. Well, yes. I mean, Devon Island is a godforsaken place. The reason why we bothered to go all the way up there uh, in the Arctic, all the way to Devon Island, is because it's the, also the largest continuous piece of rocky polar desert that we have on Earth. And if you were to define in sort of a nutshell what Mars is, Mars is a rocky polar desert from the from a climatic standpoint, uh, from a terrestrial climatic, climatic standpoint. And so it's not common to find rocky polar deserts. Polar desert climate is a climate that's cold and dry. And you find that, of course, in Antarctica, but most of it is covered under an ice sheet. The dry valleys are cold polar desert, but they are very sensitive environmentally and hard to get to. Mountaintops, the summits of, say, the Himalayas are polar desert, but they are snow-covered, they have steep slopes. Devon Island is a flat plateau expanse of rocky polar desert. And so that's why we we go there. It's a unique Mars analog in that regard on, on the Earth. And 
Yes. I, for the first time, spent a full summer here in California in 25 years. Unfortunately, because of the COVID restrictions, I actually did not go to the beach because we are not supposed to be on the beach. No, that's yeah. right. We're supposed, supposed to stay at home. So uh, that was <laughs> a wasted opportunity. But I'm longing to go back to, to Devon Island this coming summer. Great. So you're pretty confident that you'll return this summer? Uh, we're going to require that everybody be vaccinated on our team. Uh, our understanding is that uh, everybody in the northern communities, which are very isolated and small, are also vaccinated by now. And so it will all depend on the ease of travel into Canada and back into the U.S. from Canada by late July, early August. That's when we plan to go. So listeners might be interested to know that you have to make three to five trips just to reach the island itself. So first question is, who makes those travel arrangements? It seems pretty complicated. And I'm going to suspect that's a pretty difficult job. Uh, well, it's complex, but it's also streamlined by now because we've done this so many times. The way I get to Devon Island is I leave California and I fly to Vancouver, where I clear customs, you know, where I can also let my dog out because my dog comes up with me to Devon Island every summer and he serves as a polar bear guard dog. It also solves a personal dog sitting problem. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> Apollo comes with us. And and so from Vancouver, after an overnight there, we we fly uh, now with uh, already some of our teammates who've gathered there to Ottawa. Uh, so the West Coast team travels to Ottawa where we overnight again. We spend a day shopping in Ottawa for last minute fresh produce and groceries that we need for our camp. Uh, then we head north the next morning on the one airline that flies to the Arctic in Canada, which is Canadian North. And that requires us to actually change planes in Iqaluit, which used to be known as Frobisher Bay. It's on Baffin Island, and it's the capital of the territory of Nunavut. It's the equivalent of a province, but they're, they're called territories up there, not provinces. And then so we fly to Iqaluit. Iqaluit, we change planes. We fly on to Resolute Bay, and we usually arrive at the end of the day in Resolute Bay. And by the time you're in Resolute Bay, you're beyond the Arctic Circle. You are in the Arctic. Resolute is on Cornwallis Island. It's one of the northernmost communities on, on Earth. There's a population of about 250 in Resolute Bay. And then we usually overnight there or wait for the weather to get better over a few days. And then we fly to Devon Island on a small twin otter which is a sort of a cargo version of a Dash 8. It's always a, a fizz bump moment when we touch down on Devon Island because even when you launch from Resolute, you don't quite know what the weather is like on Devon Island. We don't have an automated weather station there. And so, you know, the, the runway might be obstructed. The ground might still be snowy. The winds might be in the wrong direction. So it's a, it's a crapshoot to get to Devon Island. <laughs> But once we're there, we establish our airfield, it becomes open for business, and then we can call in other planes. So it becomes a sort of a more streamlined operation. But the first flight in, which I'm always on, is is, uh, is always the, the fist bump landing flight. Hmm. I can imagine. I've had a similar experience landing in Antarctica from uh, New Zealand. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's a long flight in a slow plane. And, by, you know, the weather conditions are variable and you get there and have to turn around sometimes and uh, yep. head yep. home. Yep. You mentioned uh, your loyal guard dog, Apollo. So hypothetically, let's say Apollo alerts you that, yes, indeed, there is a polar bear nearby. What next? Right. So Apollo's main job, of course, is not to attack the polar bear. Well, He's not an that, attack dog. That would be brief. <laughs> <laughs> that would be brief. That would be brief. He's an Australian cattle dog, so he's completely out of his element there. But uh, Apollo has a very good sense of smell. He's very alert, and he, he really cues in on anything that moves in the landscape. So what we would expect Apollo to do is bark or somehow run towards whatever he might be curious about. And then what this would do for us is that we would, we would grab our shotguns, not to shoot the polar bear, but to scare the polar bear away. And so in some sense, you would not want to fire the shotguns too, too quickly. You want the polar bear to be you know, within range of being scared enough to sort of take off. <laughs> uh, the, the other thing we would do is turn on our ATVs, make sure our vehicles are up and running. And noise at camp is something that actually is a deterrent for polar bears. They, they tend to be concerned about that. So. I hope these are not birdshot. I hope these are slugs. <laughs> so we, we start with slugs. The shotguns are loaded in sequence. We The first shots out would be slugs to hit the bear at a distance if, if required. 
And then the final couple of shells are birdshot, so that you would you would blind the bear uh, if it really came to that, if it was upon you, and this was these were your last shots. Yeah. So good luck with how that. You load. Yeah, <laughs> I have plenty of polar bear stories, but I <laughs> I'm gonna yeah. just keep those for another day. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, living in Wyoming these days, half time, and having lots of. Uh, friends that tell me uh truly interesting bear stories yeah <laughs> you have uh brown bears up there black bears maybe uh grizzly bears and grizzly uh, bears oh yeah oh, they're wow. not named grizzly bear because they're nice and cuddly <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're wow. not teddy bears <laughs> <laughs> yes you know um our uh, mutual friend and colleague bill clancy went up to devon island at least yep. once and uh oh yeah several told, times he told yep. me it was just a great experience and that he was productive and enjoyed it yeah, Ken, we'll, we'll keep running the project until you and Don come up. Okay. <laughs> Deal and done. <laughs> so there's an excellent documentary that was filmed by a team from Google when they actually came to visit you on Devon Island back in 2018. And we'll make yep. sure to link uh, link that in the podcast notes. It's called Mars on Earth, A Visit to Devon Island. The documentary won a Webby Award last year for Best Branded Long Form Video, which is a really big deal. And actually, STEM Talk was nominated for a Webby Award last year, too, but we just missed out on winning that one. At any rate, I'm just guessing you're pretty pleased with that documentary, and I really enjoyed it and thought it was very well done, just by the way. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that was, I thought, a, a nice documentary. And at the same time, Devon Island is such a difficult place to to capture fully in any documentary, let alone a, a sort of a relatively short one. But this documentary does convey, uh, you know, the beauty of the site and our living quarters and sort of part of the experience of being there. But beyond that, I, I hope it serves as something that will trigger interest in other people into coming up there and experiencing that. From, from, a, from a human being to another human being, I, I wish everybody could experience Devon Island one day. It's an incredible place. It's so otherworldly in the sense that it's so different from other parts of the earth. And so unique and at the same time so so mars like one of the things we do up there is is test spacesuits and when you don a suit even a concept suit not a real pressurized suit but a concept suit and you you sort of turn around after you, the engineers set you up properly with the suit you turn around and you're looking through your helmet bubble at this landscape you you are you are on another world i can imagine you know i think the listeners might be interested in having you elaborate a little on the analog suit that we're discussing. And I know that you had planned to do some work with that up there uh, last summer, had your trip not been canceled, as you mentioned. So what kind of tests are you planning to run on the suit? Like, what, what are you doing with the suit? Yes, and just to put it in context, our, our research program up there has two components, science and exploration. On the science side, we do geology, microbiology, things that relate to Mars, but also the moon when it comes to geology. The main attractor up there being the impact crater that we have on Devon Island, the Houghton Impact Crater, which is 20 kilometers across and actually very similar in size to Shackleton Crater at the South Pole of the Moon. But on the exploration side, we, we take advantage of the fact that we actually engage in real field science up there to learn lessons that would be applicable for moon or Mars exploration. And within this exploration program, we do things such as testing, you know, future generation spacesuits or concepts of these. And for the past 20 years or so, in fact, since the early days of the project, we've been collaborating with Collins Aerospace. That's, that's their name today. The Before that, we're United Technologies Aerospace Systems. Before that, they were Hamilton Sunstrand Aerospace Systems. And Hamilton Sunstrand is probably well known in the space business as the providers of the life support systems for spacecraft, but for EVA suits as well. And so with Ham Sunstrand and Today, once again, they're called Collins Aerospace. We've been working on concept suits for future moon and Mars exploration. So this is actually a really interesting thing because the engineers want to develop a suit that is really matured through fieldwork, through actual fieldwork, not just something that you would test out in pretend science on, on, in a parking lot or even at a local rock quarry. It's something that they want to make sure that people who actually are engaged in field geology, for example, will be happy with. And the focus of the research 
on at this time is is not actually on the design of the suit per se on the garments but on the information technologies that we are wanting to integrate to the interior of the suit as you probably know but if you don't you you might have noticed that astronauts on EVA today outside the station are still using a good old fashioned spiral bound notebook on their elbow uh, which they flip through to be reminded of checklists and procedures to doing for doing this or that there is still no not much uh, electronics inside the suit in part because it's an oxygen rich environment and you want to minimize the amount of electricals inside your suit but we're getting to the point where we now have the technology to to project things onto a helmet visor to make things a lot more ergonomic and safe for the astronaut and so what uh, we are testing for example what we plan to test this summer with Collins Aerospace as we're doing field geology is a new IT and informatics interface uh, that would be integrated to the suit so for that you don't really need a fully pressurized suit you can just work with a reasonably good analog of that as long as the displays the helmet the head mounts etc are are sort of uh, of sufficient fidelity and so that's one aspect of what we plan to work on uh, the other is, as we go about our work with the suit, which has a felt weight of about 40 to 50 pounds, which is, of course, its real weight on the Earth, but it would be equivalent to the felt weight of a, of a spacesuit on the Moon, we're planning to measure as well uh, some of the metabolic and biometric data of the suit subjects as we go about our field work. This is also an area where NASA is, is interested in learning more. We have plenty of... Um, metabolic data of suit use for astronauts in swimming pools and also, of course, in zero gravity or microgravity. But there's relatively little of astronauts working in a, in a gravity environment and especially doing relevant field work, wearing a suit, etc. So this is something that we're doing for the chief medical officer's office at NASA headquarters, which is to capture some biometric data as we go about our field work in this suit. So Pascal, in addition to some of the work you were just talking about, I understand that you also want to test a glove that may enable effective single-handed operation of drones. Is that right? Yes. And in fact, this is the third leg of the stool for this summer. We've been testing since last summer this technology already. It's called the Astronaut Smart Glove. And it's a uh, it's technology that is for now in Norway, but we're now collaborating with Collins Aerospace with this team from Norway. They have a company called Intention. It spe spells with an N without the I. So Intention, N-T-E-N-T-I-O-N. -E and Intention uh, is actually a group of, uh, it's a startup. It's a, it's a group of college kids who have created this incredible human machine interface, which is a glove that captures the motions of the fingers, of the wrist, of the hand. And these motions are then turned into essentially Wi-Fi commands for any robotic asset that you might want to teleoperate. And in our case, we've been using one of the most difficult robotic assets to operate, which is a drone. Uh, if you fly drones today in the commercial world, both your hands are busy joysticking the drone. You are staring at your drone controller box in front of you, but also keeping an eye on the drone in the sky. You're very busy. And not only that, but the subtle hand motions and finger motions you need to apply are all completely inconsistent with you being able to do that in a, in a spacesuit. Your spacesuit is pressurized. You're essentially in an inflated bladder. You would be really hard-pressed, uh, literally, to joystick a drone controller like the ones we have right now and to fly a drone the way we do. Uh, this Astronaut Smart Glove solves the problem incredibly well. It's just one glove that you put on one hand. It can be the left or the right. And of course, you could imagine several of these, well, two, two gloves with serving different functions. But this one glove that you put on, you are now able to, to fly your drone just by subtle hand gestures. Uh, you wave your hands, basically, and the drone flies. So if your hand is laid flat, the drone is in hovering mode. You tilt your hand a little bit forward, in other words, you, you bend your wrist down, the drone flies forward. You pull back a little bit on your wrist, you raise your hand a little bit, the drone flies back. You tilt your hand sideways, the drone flies to the left or to the right. And you don't even have to maintain your hand sort of facing the drone or horizontally. The hand can just be down by, your, by the side of your body in the resting position. And we're talking about very subtle finger motions, which could actually be within the glove even. So the glove itself doesn't have to, the outer glove of your spacesuit might not have to move at all. 
you're talking about just moving your fingers inside your pressurized bladder, possibly. So we're very happy with this because the first test of this device, this uh, human-machine interface, was very successful on Devon Island last summer. We do still have to demonstrate that we can do this in a pressurized glove situation. So that is uh, a study that's being planned at Collins Aerospace at the factory sometime later this year. But in the meantime, this summer, we are also wanting to integrate the glove a little more into the suit and in particular display what the camera on the drone sees on this IT interface that uh, Collins Aerospace uh, has been developing. And so we're, we're very excited about, you know, playing with this a little bit in the field and, and seeing how it works. So I guess this question is going to be a little bit of an aside because you're talking about drones and we're talking about Mars. And we know that Mars atmosphere is about 60 times less dense than the atmosphere on Earth. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges that, that are present in terms of flying a drone on Mars? Yeah, so that's a very good question too. Of course, Mars has this very low atmospheric density and so it's harder to fly, it's hard to fly drones there. But drones can fly. And we anticipate that drones are useful enough that they will be worth developing as a reconnaissance and surveying and safety system in support of astronaut activities on Mars down the road. Of course, if you were at high altitude on Mars, and also if you're on the moon, you you would not be able to, of course, fly a, a drone that is using rotors. But you could imagine a drone that uses cold gas thrusters, for example. And so the way the, the drone is propelled is not necessarily going to be the same everywhere you fly it, but the concept of having a drone in support of humans, that is something that I think might have an exciting future. The other thing, of course, is that drones have been proposed as a very nice, touchless way of exploring caves. When you plan to explore a cave, the problem that you face, among other things, is that you have unknown terrain, terrain of unknown roughness. The walls of the cave are not known before you go into the cave. The amount of rubble at the bottom is not completely mapped out. You are entering an unknown, and that's a very risky thing to do with any expensive robotic asset. A drone approach, if you can fly a drone, even if it's a cold gas thruster drone, a small one, would allow you to do some recon and some quick LIDAR mapping, for example, which can be done within, within a few seconds, actually. You can do that with a, with a touchless approach, such as flying a drone. Drones are not the only way to actually robustly explore a cave on the moon or Mars. We're, we're actually looking at other solutions as well. We might talk about those later. But the notion for me of, of astronauts operating drones on, on Mars and even on the moon, if they are uh, thrustered, is actually an exciting prospect. It's a, it's a real possibility. It's really exciting. So, um, Pascal, I ran across an item not too long ago where you were talking about the Inuit, who are an indigenous people who inhabit the Arctic regions of Canada, Greenland, and Alaska. And you recommended that scientists study the Inuit culture and history because there's a lot that we can learn from them that will help us in terms of space travel. Can you talk a little bit about this concept? Yes. Well, the big challenge uh, of space travel is, of course, the time, the distance, and therefore the time that you have to spend in space. That's a real challenge because the more time we spend in space, the more resources we have to take along to support humans. That is why it's so expensive to go to Mars. It's because you can't just send people. You have to send the food that they will need and the water and everything they need. So what is exciting is that what the Inuit have in their background. But really what it is, is sort of something that's deeply in the physiology of, of human beings and mammals in general, is that we have the ability to switch to states in which we consume much less than we'd normally do in order to survive. Bears and squirrels hibernate to some extent. Humans potentially could as well. And one thing that approaches this is what the Inuit, especially the early Inuit, the ancient people of the Arctic, what they used to do was to enter this state called a state of torpor, T-O-R-P-O-R, -O -O a state of torpor. A state of torpor is how they would spend their long, dark winters. You know, so they would they would of course be very active in the sum in the spring and summer, hunting, gathering supplies, gathering meats in particular from seals and whales, collecting the blubber for for some source of heat. But otherwise, during the, the fall, the late fall and the winter, they would just hunker down in uh, shelters of their making and would spend most of their time sleeping. That's how you spend the bulk of your winter when there's no daylight outside. You just preserve the, the heat that you have and you spend most of your time sleeping. And you enter this state that is sort of a bit of a dream world state where you are spending weeks on end in torpor. 
you barely go to the bathroom, you are not eating, you are essentially in some sort of a self-induced stasis. And it's it's a really, it's, it's some sort of a mild form of suspended animation, if you will. It's a, it's a mild form of hibernation. And it's a remarkable ability that humans have, which we never use now, which probably would take some training to to get into or to to reacquire, but is something that has allowed the Inuit to survive all these generations through the many harsh winters that they that they have. And so I'm very intrigued by this concept of of torpor, maybe not so much as an operational mode of sending people to Mars, but as some sort of a contingency training that astronauts could receive so that they would know that they could survive and enter a mode in which they they would have to just hunker down, minimize the use of of supplies or resources, and essentially go into a a state of torpor, maybe to to stretch their, you know, the duration of their flight in space or, or to wait for help. Yeah, and those uh, those folks in the state of torpor, which I'm, I'm sure I th- I'm, I'm almost positive I've seen people walking around in a state of torpor. <laughs> and then there's that <laughs> with the phone there's, in front of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but a real state of torpor, uh, you would almost certainly be in ketosis as well, as you would, you know you yeah. you are eating lots of fat, and not fat. much else. Exactly. Exactly. So that's exactly it. <laughs> so, this is actually, uh, in my view, it's, there's something there that really needs to be explored. And and uh, hey, Ken, sounds like you have the the right background there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Torpor awaits. Speaking of uh, space travel, and hopefully not torpor, NASA's Perseverance rover landed on Mars back in February, as everyone knows. And I know you've been following this mission, and like all of us, you must be pleased and excited about the success so far. You know, it took a while to get there, something like seven months. It's a long journey, 300 million miles roughly. Steve Jerzyk, uh, who is NASA's acting administrator, described Perseverance's landing on Mars as, quote, a pivotal moment for the United States and space exploration. You know, NASA's landed rovers on Mars before. Can you share with the listeners why he attributed such significance to this particular landing? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure what Steve had in mind when he said that, but from my perspective, a rover like Perseverance is is a flagship mission. It's a very big and ambitious type of rover mission, which NASA sends to Mars just about once in a decade or so. It certainly takes many years to develop. People have been working on Mars 2020 for at least eight or nine years, if not a decade. Mm, yeah, uh, a decade, and, I think. Yeah, A decade. Yeah. And, and then, of course, this mission is supposed to spend probably the next five, six, seven years exploring Mars, hopefully. So you're looking at something that's, that has been on NASA's agenda and, and planning for, for almost two decades here by the time it's done. And in that sense, it's a pivotal mission. It's something that I mean, the space program is not that old. We were on the moon you know, five decades ago with Apollo. And here we're looking at missions that essentially have a, a life of about 20 years when it comes to a, an ambitious project like Perseverance. So anything of that scope and ambition, I think, qualifies as something that's pivotal in NASA's life and in the life of space exploration. But to me, uh, Perseverance is still just a building block, a, a step towards bigger and greater things down the road. And uh, the most exciting thing that Perseverance is about to do, actually, for, for us in terms of a, of a real novelty, is the test flight of this uh, helicopter that it's carrying, the Ingenuity helicopter. Mm. So NASA released recordings of Perseverance driving around on Mars' surface. And of course, the noise is pretty loud because of the rover's wheels and that are metal. And I know that mission members have been really eager to hear these sounds of the rover moving across Mars' surface. So why is that? And what is it that they're specifically look, listening for? You know, I, I, I'm not entirely sure that there is a lot of technical uh, information that one can gather from this. I mean, you, you can analyze any bit of data that comes from Mars and and somehow turn it into something useful. To me, the greatest impact of hearing sounds from Mars, both the wind on Mars and also the clunking sound of the rover wheels hitting the Martian rocks, is it adds to the experience of robots serving as our surrogates on other worlds. We tend to interface with these machines as, you know, remote sensing platforms. They send, you know, silently imaging data or maybe radar profiles 
But here we have another sense that we have as human beings and as mammals. We have another sense that is triggered, which is sound. And so that, I think, is what is the greatest added dimension that this this experiment provides, which is to create a, a wholer, you know, WHO, wholer experience of exploring Mars for, for the public in particular. Yeah, you wouldn't hear much from the wheels of a rover on the moon. <laughs> No. Well, that's, <laughs> yeah. So NASA describes perseverance as a, I'm quoting this, a robotic astrobiologist. So can you talk to us about what, what they mean by that? Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's I think, often a, an optimistic way of, of looking at things. I mean, clearly it's a, it's a figurative way of looking at things. You know, we've called opportunity and spirit uh, Mars geologists. We've called curiosity a Mars geologist. We're calling Mars 2020 or Perseverance, a, an astrobiologist on Mars. The truth is, the, the scientists who is actually behind these machines, the scientists with an S, are here on Earth. We are the astrobiologists. We are the geologists. I tend to think of these rovers as, as our rock hammers, as the tools that geologists use. These, these are extensions of ourselves, but they're not ourselves. But that's just my per personal perspective on it. But it does help to characterize the mission that uh, perseverance is on. So far, uh, spirit, opportunity, curiosity have focused mainly on, I would say, the geology or the geochemistry of, of the sites that we've explored. Perseverance is more squarely focused on finding signs of life, signs of past life, mind you, but signs of life. And so it has microscopic capabilities, it has imaging capabilities, it has spectrometry capabilities in the UV in particular. It has all kinds of instruments and performance specs for these instruments that would help us characterize fossils, say, or biosignatures that we might find in the soil or on rocks. And so it's, it's more squarely a, a life-searching experiment and therefore a signs of life-searching for ex experiment. And therefore, that's why we're calling it the astrobiologist among our rovers. But, uh, but again, the scientist is here on Earth. Yeah, and it's a, <clears throat> I find it a shame that they use terms like that. It's um, just bad public relations. It's a tool, and the scientists are humans here on Earth. And yes. this is our tool, an extension of our curiosity and our sensibility and our intellect, but it's a tool. Yes, because in some sense, you, you are overselling what the, what the rover is actually doing. If that is an astrobiologist, then why would we bother sending an exactly. astrobiologist? That, <laughs> but, it, that's partly, I think, why they do it. Uh, different, uh, different parts of NASA have different ideas about the value of humans. But uh, I'm strongly in favor of humans, even though it's unfashionable these days. As a culture, we're full of self-loathing, but I haven't gotten that far. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, humans definitely have a, have a major role to play here in, in our future in space, and on Mars in particular. Uh, so I, I view perseverance as a good stepping stone towards making that happen. Although we never do enough, basically, to, to prepare for humans quite yet. So definitely. I wish we were doing more. And as we're talking to you, and, and you mentioned it earlier, you mentioned the helicopter, and now it's yeah. very near the end of March. And so far, NASA has not tested the helicopter, which is, by the way, named Ingenuity. I think somebody in the public named it. I, I know they had yes. a contest or something, didn't they? Yeah, it's a school kid who named very it uh, cool. Ingenuity. Perseverance like as well, yeah. So, uh, it, you know, it made the journey to Mars attached to the belly of Perseverance. And I think it's planned to fly in the very near future. And if it is able to fly successfully, this will be the first powered flight on another world. Could you give listeners some background on Ingenuity and explain some of the hurdles and challenges that the engineers faced as they developed it and then as they prepare for the first flight? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, a big disclaimer, I, I have not been part of the engineering team that created this marvel and the credit of its uh, future success, really, and, and of course its design should go to them. But I did participate in some early theoretical and field studies of, of rotorcraft for Mars, and I, so I'm, I'm really quite happy uh, to see this finally happen. But the big challenge, as we mentioned earlier, about flying a rotorcraft or any powered wing aircraft is is the low density of the Martian atmosphere. The Martian atmospheric density is about 60 to 80 times less than what it is on the Earth, uh, depending on where you are. And, you know, lift is proportional 
to to density to the density of the atmosphere. So if you're dealing with atmospheric density that is you know almost a hundred times lower than what it is on the Earth, in order to create the same amount of lift, you have to either increase the area of your airfoil. Uh, lift goes is proportional to the density of atmosphere, the surface area of your airfoil, and the wind speed, the, the relative velocity the, relative to the to the atmosphere of your of your airfoil to the square of that. You know, you need to either multiply by a factor of 10 the size of your airfoils, which is, of course, unwieldy to do, or more efficiently, you, you speed up the, the speed of your rotors because then that gets squared. Uh, so you have, for example, rotors that spin, say, 10 times faster, then you get 100 times more lift. And so this is sort of the approach that was taken on, on Ingenuity. It's a combination of increasing the typical profile and the surface area of your airfoils a little bit. And then you you speed up the rotors by a factor of anywhere from six to eight compared to terrestrial rotorcraft airfoils, typical terrestrial rotorcraft airfoils. And so now you end up with a rotor system that is spinning at not just the typical three to 500 rounds per minute that helicopters on Earth use, but 2,400 rounds per minute. And then, of course, to be extremely light, the design is a counter-rotating double rotor system. So if you have a rotor that's spinning, you need something to counter the torque, the tendency for the whole body of the, of the aircraft to turn as the main rotor is turning. You have to counter that with a, a secondary rotor. On most helicopters that we fly, that's why there's a tail rotor. The tail rotor is counteracting the torque from the main rotor. But here, the, the most efficient way to design things, because you don't want to carry the, the mass, the extra mass of the tail boom, you have a counter-rotating rotor that's underneath the main rotor. And this counter-rotating rotor is also spinning in the opposite direction at 2,400 rounds per minute, which means that the relative speed of these two rotors is somewhere around 4,800 rounds per minute. I mean, it's a, it's a real finger slicer. <laughs> okay. So don't put your finger there. Uh, but that's what it takes to fly on Mars. And so it's worked in the lab. Uh, JPL has done extensive tests in a semi-vacuum chamber at Martian atmospheres. It does lift off. It can be controlled. It does settle down. It's not going to be flying very high. Uh, the maximum altitude will be, well, at least in the current early plans, is, is 5 to 10 meters. And it won't go very far either because the battery on board can only allow you to fly 90 seconds at a time. So we'll be seeing some hovering flights first and then a, a few fly rounds of the rover and then probably a, a little excursion somewhere, you know, for a minute and a half. Mm -hmm. But we're very excited because this is, this is of course, branded not even as a, as a science investigation. Right now, JPL has been going to some length to explain that this is a technology demonstration, not a science instrument at this stage. So let's, let's look at it that way and, and uh, hopefully it will be a successful tech test. Yeah. Absolutely. As a technologist, I find the helicopter, the rotorcraft fascinating. And uh, it, this is just a first step. Uh, you know, this, as right. you said, is really a tech demonstrator and isn't on the critical path to success for the mission, which are science goals. This is a technology yeah. demonstrator, but yeah. it's very cool. And it's a step in the direction where the future may lie. As you may recall, Pascal, in the 90s, when I was out at NASA Ames, there were people um, thinking about and actually doing preliminary design work on a Mars airplane. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Larry Lemke. That was Larry, uh, right. Others. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yes. forgot, I forgot his name. I was uh, yep. I'm sitting here uh, scribbling while you were talking, <laughs> trying to remember. You know how sometimes if you write, you might remember. <laughs> yep. I was trying yep. to remember who was working on that. But that yep. was it. It was Larry Lemke. You're right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The Mars airplane itself has a great future. You know, a fixed wing aircraft, which is what Larry was working on, has the ability to fly fast and level. And so it will cover a lot of ground quickly, which, which can be very useful. A helicopter tends not to fly very fast. Incidentally, I, I forgot to bring up the fact that there are, there are fundamental limitations as well to how fast you can spin rotors. So at some point, you just have to make the airfoils larger. One thing that's being avoided on the Ingenuity helicopter is to make sure that the tips of the rotor blades don't reach anywhere close to the speed of sound on Mars, yeah. because that will create a shockwave 
So they remain at 0.7 Mach, the, the tip of the rotors on, on this uh, little helicopter. The other thing that's a marvel is that this whole Ingenuity helicopter weighs only 1.8 kilos. So imagine, <laughs> don't try this at home, but it's an incredible marvel of, of uh, miniaturization. But going back to just Larry's airplane, uh, there have been many concepts of, uh, of fixed-wing aircraft for Mars as well. They, I think, have a future as well. You know, you could imagine them flying over longer distances. But of course, being less able to to safely land just because, by definition, an airplane use you know needs a a bit of a runway to safely interact with the with the ground. Sure, and those Whereas are the on, uh, yeah. those are in uh, thin supply on Mars. Exactly. <laughs> I remember asking him where where will this thing land? You know, he had uh, a really beautiful. Uh, you probably remember it. it. It was a beautiful artist rendition of the plane yes, flying yes, over yeah. the red planet. Do you remember this? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. 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 I mean, you could imagine something that um, we would fly in a canyon to be able to look sideways at the walls of the canyon, which you, you cannot really examine very well from orbit. You know, there are, there are specific things that an airplane would really do very well. A helicopter could take a look at things that way too. And, and so there's a lot of hope for it. There's a lot of good prospects for both. Mm. The windstorms were, were also a, a topic that I remember him discussing with me. Yes, yes. Although, you know, the, the windstorms, I think the main concern that they carry is the speeds that some of these winds can have. Yes, not can the density, have, but, course, but the speed. Right, you know. right. The dynamic pressure otherwise of the wind is, is actually really low. Right, unlike the movie. <laughs> unlike the movie, yeah. <laughs> it's, never, it's never right in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. So Perseverance is just one of three Mars missions that are underway right now. Um, so we have the United Arab Emirates and China also have crafts that have reached Mars. And all three of these missions launched in July of 2020 to take advantage of the close alignment of Earth and Mars. So what can you tell us about the Chinese and United Arab Emirates missions? Uh, well, not that much, uh, but the United Arab Emirates mission is... A spectacular success in the sense that this is the first time that the UAE tries anything in uh, the interplanetary realm. I mean, they, they haven't even had a moon mission. They're going for Mars up front, and they have successfully put into orbit around Mars, something that the Soviet Union <laughs> and Russia have failed to do you know, after in many attempts. So there's something to be said here uh, for the success of the UAE. And they, they, are, they are on their way to becoming a real player, so to speak, in, in the realm of uh, gathering Mars science data and being able to go to Mars. The China mission is really interesting because the first attempt that China made to reach Mars in practice was to piggyback on Russia's Phobos Grunt mission. They had a, a little orbiter that was going to be released from Phobos Grunt, but that never happened because Phobos, Phobos Grunt failed to, to reach a trans-Mars injection orbit, and it fell back uh, on Earth after you know shortly after its launch. So China, I guess, decided to take matters in its own hands and is doing this in a big way. They, they are launching this one go, an orbiter, a lander, and a rover. <laughs> Okay, which is quite ambitious. I mean, the first time the United States went to Mars to land was with the Vikings. And the Vikings, uh, there were two Vikings, Viking 1 and 2, and each Viking was an orbiter carrying a lander. Okay, so the, the fact that you might create a combo of an orbiter with a, with a, with a lander is, is not new. But what is new is the triple combo of an orbiter, lander, and rover that rolls off the lander. That is something really ambitious and novel for Mars. China has successfully done the rover rolling off a lander part a couple times already on the moon, including once on the far side. So uh, we're expecting the Mars rover to look a lot like the lunar rover and the lander on Mars to look a lot like the lunar lander on Mars. And then the orbiter is likely to look a lot like uh, a lunar orbiter as well that China has, has launched to the moon. So I think it's a coming together of technology that they've been maturing over, over the past few years. But uh, the landing hasn't happened yet. I think it's expected in July. And so they're taking their sweet time to, to pick the spot 
and and to um, and to try it out. Sure. Well, that's something they should take their time on. Uh, uh, Pascal, do you know what uh, entry, descent, and landing method they're uh, going to use? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, clearly, if you try to do Mars, it's it's always complex it's tricky, by definition. Tricky, because tricky, tricky, tricky. The good news about Mars is that it has an atmosphere. The bad news about Mars is that it has an atmosphere. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so it's tricky. You, you know, the atmosphere is so thin that you can't really do all your aero braking and parachuting with just that. You have to do retro rockets at some point, but then you cannot just do retro rockets all the way down to the surface with no aero braking and no parachutes because it's too expensive fuel wise to just you know uh, rocket your way down. So you have to have some form of aerodynamic entry and slowing down, hmm. uh, you know, heat shield or and or parachutes, yeah, they, and then eventually rockets. Yeah. It gets pretty squirrely. How, how big is their rover? Do you know? Uh, I don't, but again, I, I suspect that it's going to be in the spirit and opportunity yeah, class. I think so too. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. it's really tricky. Yeah. As most people know, or at least believe, Mars was once quite wet. And, you know, it appears to have had oceans of water as well as rivers and lakes. And then all of that water uh, is gone now, it disappeared. And Mars is, as you said earlier, essentially a desert. What is the leading theory these days? I know there are several, but what is the leading theory on where all that water went? Well, you're asking the right person in the sense that I have some very specific ideas about what Mars was like early in its past, but they are not the mainstream idea. The mainstream idea is that indeed the climate on Mars or early in Mars's history was warmer than it is today. And the fundamental observation behind this thinking is that we see ancient riverbeds we see things that look like ancient shorelines. And for water to be able to flow at a trickle, as implied by the formation of some of these finely chiseled riverbeds, the climate had to be warmer than today. The atmosphere had to be thicker. But that actually has been a real problem for climate modelers for the past several decades. And the problem is, is concisely stated as, as this phrase. It's called the faint early sun paradox. Because at the time when all of this was supposed to be happening on Mars, a thick atmosphere, warm climate, water flowing under open air, oceans possibly, uh, the sun was about 25% dimmer than it is today. And we understand this quite well from uh, models of the evolution of stars and, and the sun itself. There's evidence for that on, on Earth as well. So there's a paradox because we're trying to make a planet that is cold today much warmer than it is today at a time when the sun itself was actually dimmer. And so this faint early sun paradox has led climate modelers to come up with all kinds of tricks to warm up the Martian atmosphere in those early times. They invoke, for example, a two-bar atmosphere, an atmosphere that would be twice as thick as the Earth's atmosphere today, made of CO2, so that enough greenhousing would be happening. Global warming, essentially, is, is what's being invoked here for, for early Mars. But, you know, with modeling, you can do pretty much anything you want. You know, there is a point at which you do get Mars warm enough. And so that seems to be the way that most people think about early Mars these days, is that it was a warm, balmy place early in its history with all these open bodies of water. And the latest theory about how the water disappeared is that it disappeared into the ground, that it ended up hydrating the minerals of the, of the Martian surface, that it is all locked up in the form now of either hydrated minerals meaning part of the actual mineral structure of the clays that are on Mars, for example, but also as underground ice, okay? And then, of course, deeper down some liquid water when it gets warm enough. I have a different view of this, and this is largely based on the field work we've been doing on Devon Island for, for two decades, which is that most of these features that have been interpreted as being open bodies of water were actually formed underneath ice covers on Devon Island. We find the same types of little finger-shaped valley networks. We find the same types of ancient shorelines in a very glacial, cold climate context. These valley networks were formed underneath ice sheets as the ice was partially melting in very localized places. These lake shores were formed underneath frozen lakes and frozen oceans. But you're not dealing with open bodies of water uh, I mean, on, in the Arctic today, you are, but the cause of these features that we see that are similar to Mars are completely in a glacial context. And that, to me, is really interesting because it's not just in a, a superficial resemblance that we see. It's, it's down to very specific 
bizarreness of some of the Martian features that are rep- reproduced by the landscape in the landscape of Devon Island. And what this implies is that, yes, Mars was wet early in its history, wetter than today. But the source of the warmth was not a thicker atmosphere. It was not a denser, thicker atmosphere. The source of the warmth was the ground. Planet Mars at the time was a young planet. Volcanism was more active. Impacts were more frequent. The geothermal heat flux, the amount of heat released by the planet, was significantly higher than it is today. This is true for all planets and models of how they form and evolve. However, because of the faint early sun in particular, the outer surface of Mars, the atmosphere of Mars, was frigid, as cold, if not colder, than it is today. And so any water that would reach the surface would freeze down onto the surface onto vast, into vast expanses of ice cover. So the way I imagine early Mars is a, a very cold world on which there was a lot more ice exposed at the surface, where the ice was melting, but underneath at the base of the ice covers from the ground being warmed. And eventually the ice got recycled into the ground by impacts, churned, partly lost to space. The rest of the process remains the same, but the the environment that we're talking about on early Mars was not a balmy, Earth-like world, but a place that was really frigid and, and cold. And the reason why at the time there was a lot more ice at the surface than there is today, if the climates were the same, is because at the time there was a lot more recycling of, of water in and out of the crust of Mars from, again, volcanism impacts, whereas today that uh, volcanism has, has died down significantly, impacts are less frequent, and so any ice ice that's exposed at the surface gets eventually buried in dust and and that's all that's what we're seeing so so i have a different view here of of what early mars was like it's it was still a place exciting for life because it had liquid water but it's not it wasn't sort of the this geocentric view in my view this geocentric view of mars being you know sort of more Mm earth-like at the time yeah, there's a certain uh, fascination that people have with the idea that Mars was just like Earth, and uh, yeah, and then it took this turn for the worse, and this yeah. lies in our future as well. That kind of story, uh, yeah. Pascal. Um, if you were the NASA administrator, and and, and, if, <laughs> and, and if you were, you, God bless you us. yeah, you would need <laughs> probably some medication because um, you're such a nice guy. I would, I would not wish that on you. But 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 if you were, uh, how would you set about? And, and if you believed, uh, you had faith or confidence at least in your hypotheses, how would you set about testing it? What what would the mission to Mars do that would help sort this out? It's actually born already by the data that we have. It's it's a matter of realizing how you interpret how sometimes how you interpret the data carry some assumptions that are often not stated. So for example, when when people look at valley networks on Mars, these dried riverbeds and claim that they were formed under a warm climate, the underlying assumption there is that the water was stable under open air. But in the glacial hypothesis, these valleys were not under open air. They were under a very thin atmosphere, but covered by ice. So the ice was providing the confining pressure to allow liquid water to flow and carve out the valleys, not an atmosphere that was thick. So it's, it's really a matter of, over time, changing one's or broadening one's interpretation of exploring multiple hypotheses, but more multiple than one might even think, uh, in terms of even questioning some of your assumptions. You see an ancient riverbed, you should not assume that the water was flowing under open air you might consider that there was something else providing the confining pressure. So that's one direction for the research that I would encourage. But in terms of our goals on Mars, let's let's not forget why we're so excited about Mars. I mean, there's the dimension, of course, of paving the way to getting humans there. And of course, that's something that, you know, we should do more of and, and faster. But on the scientific front, the real, the big driver of our going to Mars is the search for life. And the real thing that we should say more explicitly is that we are searching for alien life. Alien life. And there's no amount of fossil finding that even Mars 2020 could do that would establish that we found alien life. Perseverance could be driving by a rocky outcrop here where there are dinosaur bones jutting at you, or whatever bones they are. And I'm, of course, joking. We, you know, but let's say there were algal, ancient algal mats or ancient microbial colonies that, that left a fossil signature that was very clear that it was biological. There is no way we could determine that we are looking at alien life. I mean, it's on an alien world, but it could be Earth life exported to Mars or 
the reverse. Mars life, Mars life could have started on Mars and then been exported to the Earth, and and we are descendants of this life. The point is, planets are understood now not to be isolated systems. We have meteorites that have come naturally from Mars. Large asteroids and comets hit Mars. They eject rocks into space. The unlucky ones fall on Earth. The really unlucky ones get picked up by geologists and sliced up. We have. Over a hundred Martian meteorites now in our meteorite collection of over ten thousand meteorites uh, that we know have come from Mars. That implies that these planets are are not isolated, and conceivably, Earth life could have been ejected by a large impact into space and seeded Mars somewhere early in Mars's history, or some time in early Mars's history. In which case, life could have taken off on Mars at its own pace, you know, with its own local rules, but it would still be genetically Earth life. All life on Earth fits on what's known as the tree of life. It's a, it's a genetic tree of life. Whether you believe in evolution or not, that doesn't make any difference. It's the fact that all forms of life on Earth share some DNA in common. And technically, the tree of life doesn't even use DNA. It uses 16S RNA, which is something that preserves better over time and is more characteristic of, of our, our lineage. But all life on Earth, no exception, current and past, fits on this tree of life, which is a genetic tree of life. The the most straightforward interpretation, of course, is an evolutionary interpretation for life, that all life on Earth came from a single common ancestor that was a microbial co- ancestor. It is no longer preserved in the fossil record, but uh, like like vectors, all this commonness that we have with all forms of life in terms of our genetic makeup points towards that that common origin. The big question for life that we would find on Mars is, would it fit on that tree or would it not? In order to do that, you have to find the life alive. Our search for life on Mars has to stop being about past life. It has to really refocus and zoom in. If we're serious about finding alien life on Mars, uh, signs of it, it has to really refocus on extant life, life that might be there today. And the one big lesson that we've learned from recent missions to Mars all the way to since the Viking days is that the surface of Mars is very hostile to any form of life that we know of on the Earth. Okay, it's a, The UV flux at the surface of Mars is 800 times what it is on the Earth. The radiation, the, the, the high-energy ionizing radiation environment is higher than what it is on the Earth. The temperatures are much colder than what we have on the Earth. The atmospheric pressure is lower. While there are some bugs that would be okay kind of eking their way through life under one of these conditions, there's nothing that we know of on Earth that would survive all of these conditions at the same time. And so, therefore, the surface of Mars right now is lethal if exposed right there at the surface to any form of terrestrial life. Our best bet, therefore, if we hope to find something that might look like us or at least have the same uh, range of adaptations as life on Earth, and to find our best hope of finding anything that's living is likely to go underground. We have to either drill, which is hard to do, it's not easy, and drill not several meters, which probably won't do much, but tens of meters, if not hundreds of meters on Mars to get down into uh, the subsurface. But a few meters already would help because you would be taking out a number of threats like ionizing radiation, micrometeorite bombardment, things like that, drastic temperature changes as well. So going underground is one way, drilling, sort of drilling into the ground is one way of doing this. The other, of course, is to go to places wherever you can where there might be liquid water today on Mars that's not too briny, not too salty. And one of my biggest hopes is that after all these years of knowing that there are volcanoes on Mars, including the biggest ones in the solar system, is to go into these volcanoes. Some of these volcanoes on Mars, especially the large ones, are probably still active they are not erupting, but they could just be dormant. They might have magma chambers still full of magma. They could be erupting once every 100 million years at this stage. Uh, I don't think we should wait for an eruption. There are things, however, like lava tubes and caves on the flanks of these volcanoes, which could afford an easy-to-access underground environment that's sheltered, moist possibly, slightly warmer than the surroundings. It's not going to be an easy search, but to me, we have to find living life on Mars, because that's the only way to do genetics on it. 
No amount of fossil finding will allow you to do genetics on what we find. And so, again, if you saw dinosaur bones or these microbial mats, uh, you might say, okay, morphologically, they are different from what we have on Earth. But then life on Earth is so diverse morphologically that you couldn't tell anything from that. You know, you would have to really find something to establish the alienness of life, and that is to do genetics on it. To do genetics on it, it has to be alive or dead for really not a long time. And to find it alive, you've got to go underground. Makes, that mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so Avi Loeb is a Harvard astrophysicist who wrote the book Extraterrestrial, The First Sign of Intelligent Life Beyond Earth. And he says that aliens have visited the Earth, and he's not the only one who believes that. So there have been several news stories lately about an uptick of reports from Navy and Air Force pilots that have observed UFOs. Now, before I get your thoughts about this uptick in UFO sightings, first question for you, do you think that we are alone in the galaxy? Yes. but. Not for the reason why one might assume. I don't think we're alone in the galaxy just because we are so special and are the result, for example, of divine will or intervention. I think that we are alone in the sense that we're def- we're probably not many. And I, I don't know if, uh, do, do we have time for a quick aside on the Drake equation here? I, I think the Drake equation would be of great interest. Okay. So, so part of the reason why I think we're not alone is because there's something called the Drake Equation. Uh, Frank Drake is uh, the founder of the field of SETI. He's a radio astronomer. He actually also uh, directs the SETI Institute where I work, at least uh, used to before he retired. And Frank came up with the Drake Equation, which is a, a formula that mathematically is very simple. It's just a multiplication of seven terms, seven variables. And what this multiplication does is that it gives you the number capital N of advanced civilizations in our galaxy right now. And so here's how the equation goes really quickly. Uh, N equals the, the rate of star formation in our galaxy times the fraction of stars that have planets around them times the number of environments suitable for life within each of these planetary systems times the fraction of those planets on which the environment is suitable for life, where life actually emerges, times the fraction of those on which life exists, but where it becomes intelligent, and that can be defined in different ways, times the fraction of those planets with intelligent life on them, where the life becomes an advanced civilization, which is also defined actually more specifically here as an in- a civilization that is capable of interstellar communication. It doesn't necessarily engage in it, but it's capable of it, times the longevity. So the average longevity, that's the seventh term, the average longevity of an advanced civilization. Now, needless to say, we don't know the exact number to any one of these variables, and so we don't exactly know what n in it. And some of these terms conceivably have, you know, are unknown to, to possibly up to three orders of magnitude, okay? But if we were to plug in uh, some numbers that I would consider plausible that are based on either what we've observed so far, or even if it, the Earth is the only example that we have, that we just use the Earth as a sort of the guiding general rule, if the Earth were representative, basically, of what happens to life elsewhere in the galaxy, then you plug in the numbers and you realize that the number n is not a large number. And I, I have talks on YouTube that sort of go over this in more detail, but the real killer term is F sub i, the fraction of planets that have life on which life becomes intelligent. And the reason why I think F sub i is, again, based on the only datum that we have, which is the Earth, is because while it took almost no time for life to appear on Earth, so life itself is not rare, it's probably very common. It could even exist as an alien form on other bodies within our own solar system, in the oceans of Europa, in the oceans of Enceladus, possibly in the atmosphere of Jupiter and Saturn, etc. While microbial life, in other words, primitive, relatively simple forms of life might not be rare at all. Intelligent life took an insane amount of time, half the age of our galaxy for one thing, to emerge on Earth. And what that tells me is that there is no straightforward, immediate, urgent path to reach anything that we would consider an intelligent form of life. Now, that, of course, has to be defined in some way. I 
tend to think of the stage of intelligent life as the, the emergence of something as intelligent as Homo erectus here on Earth, which was about a million to two million years ago. But you could define intelligent life as the emergence of, of the beaver. It doesn't make any difference because what matters ultimately is the fraction of those planets with beavers that turn out an intelligent civilization, an advanced civilization, meaning one that's capable of interstellar communication. So wherever you draw the line for intelligence, what matters, you know, is the step to the next step, which is the fraction of those that become an advanced civilization. And once, if you define Homo erectus as the time at which life on Earth became intelligent, then the time it took for us to become a, an advanced communicating civilization was very short. It took about two million years to go from Homo erectus to Maxwell, James Clerk Maxwell, who <laughs> that's my definition of the start of our advanced civilization. James Clerk Maxwell came up with Maxwell's equations for the transmission of electromagnetic waves. He understood for the first time the dual nature of electric fields and magnetic fields and their intermingling to, to form electromagnetic magnetic radiation. That's the basis for radio astronomy and our understanding of, of light, for example. Anyway, uh, from that point on, we became a civilization capable of interstellar communication. The, the biggest step, the, the, the thing that took the longest time to emerge in all this wasn't even life on Earth once the environment was suitable for life. It was the emergence of intelligence. And again, that took a very tortuous path. It was not straightforward at all. It's unclear that intelligence would have provided a huge edge to any form of life earlier. I mean, it mattered more to be able to hide from your predators than to, <laughs> to necessarily be able to, to be technologically capable. At least it was more expedient. And so F sub i, the fraction of planets where life emerges, where life actually becomes intelligent, is a number that's hard to estimate. But if you estimate it by comparing the time we've had, the time it took for intelligence to emerge versus the time that it took just life itself to emerge, you end up with something like one in 10,000, one in 10,000. It's 0. 0.0002 or so. Well, that, or point, point zero zero 0.002 or point zero zero 0.001, okay, uh, somewhere in there. That is the real killer of the number N, in my view, in our galaxy. As much as there must be planets out there that have life on them, including things that you know we might consider, we might call animals and even beasts and all kinds of oceans with things we might call whales and you know squids, there probably are very few planets with something that is intelligent, and even fewer that have reached a point of being an intelligent, advanced civilization capable of interstellar communication. So you plug in the numbers, and I end up with n equals about 1. Now, many error bars on each term, but if n equals 1, then we are it. There's 1 per galaxy of our scale. We're still not alone in the universe. You know, there are 100, over 100 billion galaxies in our universe. So, you know, if each galaxy had one civilization, we're still in very good company in the big picture. But within our galaxy, in spite of all these exoplanets being found around nearby stars, that doesn't make any difference, really. I mean, that doesn't make much difference. As soon as you have one term in the multiplication that is close to zero, it brings everything down. It's the Debbie Downer of, of the Drake equation, F sub i. Yeah. Uh, but and if, so, you know, the yeah. issue there, Pascal, is, and, and I tend to agree, agree with you, the strong assumption in your analysis or your interpretation of the equation is that the Earth is a good model and a right. universal model in terms right. of the temporal development of intelligence. That's and, right. And that, and that could be very different in a, a different place yes. with different circumstances. That's recognized, and that is indeed why the error bar should not be forgotten. Right. But if you, if you use the one datum that we have, because everything else is speculative, then that is the the likely conclusion at this point. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just pointing out that yeah. that the universality assumption is also speculative. Yep. But uh, one of the consequences is that, you know, a small number for n, and it doesn't have to be one, it could be, you know, just exactly. a, a relatively small number. Exactly. One of the implications of that, of course, is that well, we shouldn't be surprised we haven't heard from anybody yet. The Fermi paradox, right. you know, the, the argument that if there are so many out there, where are they? Why haven't we heard from them? Well, that 
is no longer a paradox. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's rather silly in the face of it. And, yeah. and we should be concerned about N going from one to zero. We should be, absolutely, <laughs> yes. That's a more likely but, outcome. Uh, so SETI, in my view, should should focus on extragalactic searches. We we should be staring at Andromeda and just keep staring at Andromeda, in my view, yeah. and a few other nearby galaxies that are massive. And then to go back to, to Don's question, which is, do I think we are alone in our galaxy? Well, we, we could be many, you know, but... It's it's not that clear to me that we should be expecting there to be advanced civilizations uh, within our own galaxy that that close to us. Mm -hmm. And culturally, something difficult to accept, by the way, because it's almost that you know we we are we are wanting to be open minded about this. We we want to imagine our galaxy as being a, a Star Trekian or Star Warsian galaxy, you know, with with bars. Where Wookies. people from different Wookies and different people from different planets hang out and and get get music gigs. I know but, I've seen a Wookie. Uh, <laughs> and it was in San Francisco, by the way. It's definitely a Wookie. Okay, but uh, it's you know it's also being open minded to to realize that even though we could be the result of a of a natural course of events, in other words, not no divine intervention there, we could still be rare. Uh, and that is maybe sobering. Indeed. So uh, Don mentioned this rash of people who are convinced they've seen UFOs, and uh, and she mentioned uh, Avi Loeb. Uh, what do you think's behind this uh, current uptick in in people talking about UFOs, even otherwise sort of creditable people, right? You know, you, military pilots and the such. Yeah, I I don't necessarily know if there's an actual uptick in observations. I think there might be an uptake in the spreading of the news. That could be a reflection of our social media age mm -hmm. where people speak out more readily and when they do it's it spreads more quickly and more widely. So it's hard to disentangle uh your observation from from what might have been the background level of actual observations and reports yeah, in the past, yeah. right? Uh, but I think that there's, first of all, let's not forget that they are, the most important word in UFO is you. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> it's unidentified. Yeah. So we don't know what we're reporting. We don't know what we're seeing here when they report these things. And when it comes to Abby Loeb's uh, opinion that, you know, there's, you know, that we're not alone and somehow that's definite, I tend to go back to Carl Sagan's argument, which is that any extraordinary claim requires extraordinary evidence. And for something as extraordinary as as important, I would say, and therefore as extraordinary as, you know, claiming or asserting that we are not alone in our galaxy in terms of being an intelligent civilization, that there are others, that requires more a lot more than just circumstantial observations or interpretations, even from credible people. It requires repeated observations, testing of the hypothesis, you know, and it's a tall order. It's, it's difficult. You know, I sometimes think of, a, of an indigenous tribe on some Pacific island somewhere, one day seeing a, you know, a, a Spanish galleon show up on the horizon. And then the guy runs back to his village on the other side of the island and says, hey, I, I saw this amazing UFO out there on the horizon. It, it was a, sh you know, it was like our canoes, but hundred times bigger, it seemed. And then the people in the in the tribe might say, well, you know, is that for real? They all go to the other side of the island and they see nothing on the horizon. You know, it just passed and went. So there has to be more, and, and yet the observation might have been real. Uh, so there has to be stronger evidence that everybody can share and verify for, for this to be established. It can't be just one credible person seeing something it has to be several credible people seeing the same thing. <laughs> of, of course, but the uh, I think you were on to explaining the phenomena in the beginning of your comments when you talked about the influence of social media yeah. and also societal change. Yeah. I mean, this would have been, uh, it, it's not career enhancing now, by the way, to report these things if you're a military pilot, but uh, it would have been, you would have been treated much differently, say 20 years ago. Yeah. So there's cultural changes that uh, yeah. that have made it more possible, and and I think social media in particular. Yep. 
So let's uh, switch a little bit and talk about manned missions to Mars. And you think, uh, from what I understand, you think we need to have a very measured approach and that first we should execute a round trip and not even worry about landing on Mars. So can you elaborate a little bit on this this concept? Yeah, well, you know, go, going to Mars is, is, well, going into space in general in the past has been the privilege of nations that were technologically advanced and, and capable. So, so going to Mars for some for an organization like NASA, okay, uh, in my view, has to obviously be something that is phased, sustainable, so to speak. I mean, I, I'm always weary of, of that word a little bit because not a lot of things in life are sustainable. But what I mean by that is an approach to going to Mars that calls for uh, a continued approach and a continued exploration of the place as opposed to sort of one-offs, okay? So for, for NASA... In my view, the way to go to Mars is with a phased approach, with big milestones that will keep people excited along the way, as, as you, along the program, that is, as you climax to humans reaching the surface of Mars and then starting to do things. So having milestones that are easier to reach along the way, but not, not waste of time, not, not diversions, but just milestones that are clearly defined would be, in my view, the way NASA should, should approach humans to Mars. Now, the other thing, of course, is that for you to be an effective explorer on Mars, you need an infrastructure. We can't do Mars with sort of the way we did the moon with three days at the surface and then we come back because the trip is too long for such a short time at the surface of Mars to, to be worth it. So we're looking at the very least at uh, a few weeks to a few months at the surface of Mars to all the way to possibly a year and a half on Mars, okay, the, the whole opposition class approach where you have a, a longer stay on Mars and a total round trip time of two and a half years. If you're going to have a long stay on Mars to be effective explorers, you have to have a lot of stuff already on Mars. So if if we approach going to Mars with a program that has to have all kinds of mature systems be matured at the same time and getting to the surface of Mars and getting all lined up at once for humans to go, you're looking at a program that ha- would have a huge spike in, in resources in readiness requirements on all systems on all fronts at the same time. And so that to me is not a very good approach to going to Mars. On the other hand, if you have a phased approach where, you know, the first mission of a program to Mars is us going sending astronauts to a million miles and back. That would be an amazing milestone. We've never done that. Uh, it'd be just halfway to Mars or not even halfway to Mars, a, a, a tenth of the way. And that would be a 10 million mile mission. And then eventually we go to Mars orbit, which is essentially the Apollo 8 of going to Mars. Except that, of course, we don't come back on a free return trajectory. We spend some time in Mars orbit. And while we're there, we explore Phobos and Deimos, the two moons of Mars, which are very exciting in their own right and are at the right size for, for warranting human exploration. And then eventually you, you, you start lining up hardware on Mars over time. And then eventually, by the time it's all lined up, humans will have gone to Mars a few times. We will have practiced the, the round trip. And it's not so much practicing from the standpoint of getting humans used to it. The, the big challenge of going to Mars is the reliability of spacecraft systems is to have spacecraft systems that work without resupply or repair from earth you know for months to years on end that is the type of thing that has to be matured before we are ready to to reliably go to mars and back right now with the space station we have to repair things and resupply it every every few months we don't have a system that has the reliability required to send us to Mars. And so to, to get to the point you're reliable, you have to start doing these round trips. And there's no need to land on Mars up front. You, you do it progressively. Now, on the other hand, if you are leading a private effort like Elon Musk, and you are singularly focused on getting humans to the surface of Mars, because it's a private effort, you can cut corners, you can take more risk, you can spend the money you want where you want to. It becomes you know, the subject of a person's whim. And it doesn't mean that it's not thought through or, or a well-planned. It just means that you have a lot more flexibility in sort of how you do things and where you cut corners. You could go to Mars direct. I, I actually uh, tried to get Elon to get him interested in Phobos and Deimos as a, as a first step to going to Mars. And he was quite, quite frankly not interested. He, he said he wants to go to the surface of Mars. If you want to go to Mars, go to Mars is what he said. Yeah. And I, I get that. Uh, but that's something that uh, is, is not applicable to, to NASA, I don't think. No, nor to him in my view. Uh, it's like saying I want to go to Pluto. But uh, he, he's not going to go to Mars with people in my lifetime. It's a huge investment. It's got 
extra zeros in the budget, I think. Even accounting for how expensive NASA is to operate, uh, I don't think you're going to shave. Some of the fundamental difficulties will remain, and a private company is not going to be eager to kill people. Yeah, going to Mars is definitely difficult, and we'll add zeros to what Elon has done right, so far. big zeros. But at, at the same time, I, I'm <laughs> I'm always weary to say never when it comes to him, because uh, he, he tends to deliver what he promises a little behind schedule, but on the other hand, it, it is it is still done. Uh, uh, so I'll... Uh, I'll leave that as a, I'll give him some benefit of the doubt here. <laughs> we'll, we'll check back with you in 2026. The, uh, something you, you really said, you said that really floated my boat was uh, Phobos and Deimos. Yeah. I think they're spectacularly interesting locations yeah. for exploration and uh, afford advantages compared to going directly to the surface. And I know you and I worked on a couple studies having to do with Phobos and Deimos, and you were, yep. you were a, a, an excellent contributor to those studies, by the way. Well, thanks, Ken. Thanks. Yeah, Phobos and Deimos. The, the thing that I find remarkable, there are several things I find remarkable about them uh, really quickly. I mean, these are the two moons of Mars, right? And they were discovered by American astronomer uh, Azaf Hall from the, from the U.S. Naval Observatory in Washington. Phobos and Deimos are the closest sort of permanent objects. I, I'm discounting the ones that you know drift by us and disappear in, into oblivion. Phobos and Deimos are the closest worlds to us whose nature we still completely ignore. In other words, we, we don't know what they are. Are they captured asteroids? In which case, they would be asteroids. Are they captured comets, dead comet nuclei? In which the case, they would be comet nuclei. Are they remnants of Mars's formation, in which case they would be pieces of planetesimals, essentially, that are still in orbit around Mars? Are they reaccreted Mars disks and rings, uh, in which case they would be multi-generational satellites or the remnants of, of a former larger moon of Mars or of several? We, we have no idea. And these are radically different types of objects. So we still have no idea what Phobos and Deimos are. Now, a lot of this will, should get resolved with the upcoming Japanese mission, a robotic mission led by the Japanese, by JAXA, called MMX, Mars Moons Exploration Mission. They plan to land on Phobos, return a sample, fly by Deimos as well, although that part is still not firmed up. And we hope, of course, from having samples from Phobos, we hope to finally learn what Phobos uh, is and by extension, possibly what, what Deimos might be. I mean, the other thing, of course, is that Phobos and Deimos could be two different things. One could be, the, you know, a captured asteroid, the other one a captured comet. So we, we, we don't know. But beyond MMX, these places will still be left with a lot of mystery. And we will want to understand their interior, how many fragments of Mars might be sitting on their surface, because Mars has ejected meteorites to Earth, but some have been intercepted by Phobos and Deimos on their way out. How much water might they contain? Because that uh, could be an interesting resource and really well-placed because it would be in orbit around Mars. There's also the notion that Phobos and Deimos could be a good place to cache samples from Mars robotically return sample from Mars. For a human crew then, some of these early missions with humans going to Mars could have a real good role scientifically regarding Mars, which is to collect or retrieve some of these samples that would have been stashed, if you will, from different locations on Mars, stashed and gathered on Phobos, for example. Hmm. So one would explore not only Phobos, but also bring back a treasure trove of Martian materials that you don't want to risk sending back in, in a robotic mission, for example. Mm -hmm. So in addition to being a planetary scientist, you are an accomplished artist, and I've seen some of your work. Were you able to get much painting done uh, this past year? You've been kind of in COVID land, particularly in California. Does that afford you a lot of time to paint? Yeah, you're too kind. I can't. Yeah, I, I did actually find more time to paint, mainly because I was able to to stay at home more and not have these month-long trips left and right, you know, doing field work. And so I... I was able to to finish a few new paintings. I post my paintings on my website for, for anybody who might be interested, pascallee.net. But, the, you know, s some of them are making their way out there, so I'm, I'm quite happy about that. Yeah, I think they're quite good. Yeah, I'm I, I've, I've concluded in the end that these paintings are born out of my frustration that the space program is, is never moving fast enough. Mm -hmm. So I, I spend my time painting about uh, visions or vistas of humans uh, 
farther and deeper into space and time. Uh, there you go. So we'll, we'll make sure that we include a link in our show notes to your art. I guess we're kind of curious, what are some of your favorite pieces? Uh, one, of, one piece that I like that I finished not so long ago uh, is called Mars Crater Drive-By. It shows you uh, an impact crater seen from above on Mars. And there's a trail that sort of uh, cuts across the landscape. And it's uh, a trail left by a column of two pressurized rovers, each followed by two robotic ATVs. So it's, uh, it's just a natural history type view of Mars, you know, s- s- looking at the Martian landscape from above. But it also shows these two pieces of uh, what, what these hardware elements that are brought in by humans. And the trail makes a detour to the rim of the crater and checks it out. I was e- really imagining, once I, once I painted the crater, how I would go about exploring it. And so I drew a traverse trail that went around the rougher parts of the ejector blanket and found a path through some less rough parts. And then we parked the pressurized rover there shy of the rim of the crater itself. And then we EVA'd with the two robotic ATVs that uh, that accompany each pressurized rover. We EVA'd to the rim and checked out the crater. Uh, and then the column moved on and the ATVs continued in robotic mode following following their pressurized rovers. So there was a concept of operation that was folded into this as well, which which results from our work on Devon Island. Yeah, that's very cool. So, Pascal, last time you were on STEM Talk, we talked about your children's book, Mission to Mars, which you wrote in hopes of inspiring children to take an interest in science and also space travel. And you also mentioned that you were working on a book for adults that was tentatively titled From Earth to Mars. So how's that book coming along? It's coming along. Uh, I've been working on it. Uh, It's not done yet. Uh, It it tends to get uh, updated. It needs updating more often than I thought it would. (laughs) But uh, I'm working on it, and I I don't have a date for it to come out yet, but I'll, I'll, I'll let people know for sure. Fantastic. Well, this has been so much fun, Pascal. We always love to talk with you. And I'm guessing you must feel pretty good about all the current missions to Mars as well as the future of space exploration. And I understand that you think we are on the verge of a great age of renewal of human exploration. So can you elaborate a little bit on this to wrap up the the podcast? You know, I I do think so. I think the the emergence of the private sector being able to do things in space is, is really speeding things up and multiplying the opportunities that we have in space. The current focus of us returning to the moon, I think, is great. It makes sense. There are other nations targeting the moon, too. So we can't we cannot just ignore the moon. Plus, there are interesting things to explore on the moon. What I would like to see in our in our current uh, national effort from the U.S. on the moon is that we do everything we can to to prepare ourselves for Mars in the process, not have Mars as an afterthought, as it it somehow s- still seems to be in some meetings that I attend, but that Mars is really front and center as to this is where we want to go, this is what we want to do, and therefore this is what we should be doing on the moon to prepare us for that. Because there are many options otherwise to doing things on the moon, and you know we can't do them all. But we do want to go to Mars, and we should be going to Mars. And there are specific things that we should be we should be planning on doing on the moon that would really prepare us well for Mars. So I'd like this moon to Mars effort be be more more of a driver than than it uh, than it is, even. Yeah. Well, fantastic! It's been awesome having you on the podcast as always, Pascal. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I, I have plenty of questions for you, but uh, next time maybe. Yeah, we'll Thank turn you. it around. Well, <laughs> thank you, Pascal. It was wonderful. Thanks. STEM Talk. 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 So I have to say, don't you just love Pascal's passion? I love chatting with him. He's been dreaming about the planets in our galaxy and especially Mars ever since he was a child. And listening to Pascal reminds me that this truly is an exciting time for space exploration. John, you're absolutely right. And, uh, just as Pascal conveyed and you just reiterated, this is a wonderful time to be interested in space. You know, it seemed like a few years ago or maybe a decade for the last decade, we went through a period where it, it kind of seemed as if people had sort of lost interest in space and were focused on more important things like like buttons. <laughs> but Pascal was never one of those people. And thanks to him and other planetary scientists, there is now a renewed and growing enthusiasm for us Earthlings to learn more about space and our place in it. Yeah, absolutely. If you enjoyed this interview as much as Ken and I did, we invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and other episodes at stemtalk.us. This is Don Conega signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk.
Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.